imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Of course, if there is a need of reconciliation between two parties, then they are at odds with one another. To use that terminology, then man came into disagreement, if you want to say that, with God when he transgressed God's law and man's sin. 1 John 3, 4, Romans 3, 23, and Romans 6, 23. God being a perfectly just God. And if that's all there was to his dealings with man would have destroyed him at that time because of the law of sin and death. A perfect law system says you sin, you die. But we see that God is also gracious and merciful and that He loves the souls of men and women who are in sin. Though they left Him, though they transgressed His will, and so he's authored a plan. And it's by the gospel system, the power of God to save us, Romans 1.16, that we have that salvation. Truly, when we do as Paul said, and preach the word, then we're preaching the word of reconciliation. The way to where the two estranged parties can be one again. And so we should want to know how to study the Bible to ascertain the authority of Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life and no man comes to the Father but by Him. John 14, 6. We ought to want to know His Word because it will judge all men in the last day. John 12 and verse 48. And yet so many people don't know much about how to study the Bible. And in this day and age there's far, far more Bible ignorance and even more ignorance of how to study it than has ever been probably in the last several hundred years. We know that Paul told the young preacher Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a right way to handle the word of God. That implies there's a wrong way to handle it. And you have to learn how to rightly divide, how to handle it correctly. Now this sermon today, continuing on with the Word of Reconciliation series, emphasizes how so many people don't understand the Bible and it will lay groundwork, and I hope in a very simple fashion, as much as the topic will allow, for us to understand better how to do this. Now some of you, this is going to be very familiar ground, others it may not be. I think for all who know the importance of the Word of God, the seed of the kingdom, which is the Word of God, Luke 8, 11, that it's a very important study and always will be if people will become Christians as that term is defined and used in the New Testament of the Christ. I think I've had several situations like the one I'm going to relate to you over my preaching career. Here recently in the process of having therapy done to my wrist over the surgery I had many weeks ago. Knowing that I was a preacher, then the therapist began to talk a little bit about things. And it came around then to the Bible. And I made the comment that, well, a lot of people have Bibles, but they really don't know what they say because they don't know how to understand them. I said some people just open up the Bible and put their finger there and say, now what is God telling me to do today? And I didn't expect this, but this is what I heard as soon as I said it. She said, yes, I've done that quite often. And I said, well, you'll never learn the way of salvation trying to study it that way. Or if you do, it's going to certainly take a lot longer time than you ever thought about it taking. I know of other situations where that kind of thing has happened. I read of a situation to where a man who was preaching but on the side he did survey work and a fellow called him and wanted him to survey a piece of property and as they rode out to the property together the man was really elated that he was able to finally buy some property he liked the community and he had been having to do a lot of moving around it wasn't good for his wife and family and they were going to build a place uh, on that property 
And in the process, it got around to the Bible. And um, it got around to that because he said, you know, this will allow my wife to attend church at a certain place all the time. And the preacher spoke up and said, well, what, what about you? Can't you go too? He said, yes, I go when I can. Uh, he said, but I do study my Bible every day. He said, well, how's that working for you? He said, well, I started in Genesis and I started reading through it. And I'm pretty much uh, halfway through the, the Old Testament. And he said, uh, why are you studying the Bible? He said, well, I want to be saved. I'm looking for how to be saved. And the preacher said, well, you're going to have to study more than the Old Testament. And he said, I began there and he rejourned. I preached him a sermon. And then he got to the end of the sermon before they got to the land. He said, you know, I've never heard it presented like that before. And as time went on, the man was converted. Folks, there will never be anybody become a Christian who does not rightly divide the word of truth and thereby learn how Christ saves people through the gospel. And if we're going to understand the word of reconciliation, we must understand the layout of the Bible, if you want to call it that. You remember, as most do, that God has spoken to man. In the time past, He spoke to the fathers by the prophets. And as the Hebrew writer continued in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, in these last days he's spoken unto us by his Son. All that he has spoken, all that he has spoken was for the good of man in general. And where he has given those words is the Bible. What he spoke to the fathers by the prophets is of course recorded in the first half of the Bible, known as the Old Testament, those 39 books. And what He speaks to us by His Son is recorded in the New Testament of the Christ. 27 books, the second half of the Bible. As what things soever the law saith, Paul wrote in Romans 3.19, it saith to them who are under the law. So I learn that what is said in the Old Testament is said to those who lived in that age of the world. And likewise, what is said by God through His Son is said to those who live in the Christian age under the authority of Christ and the words of the New Testament. Of course, the whole Bible is inspired of the Holy Spirit. That is, every human writer was guided infallibly by the Holy Spirit to write down God's will. It is as much the Word of God, that is the Old Testament, as is the New Testament. For I say again, God via the Holy Spirit spoke it. In it, there are many, many lessons that have to do with God's divine work with man, His providence, the gradual unfolding down through history of the great scheme of redemption, how He would save man from sin through Jesus Christ. You find much having to do with divine providence, divine government. You find so many lessons showing how God condemns what is wrong and He approves then what is right. How He blesses those that love the truth and would give their lives rather than disobey it. And how He punishes those who do not obey Him. And there are so many lessons teaching how weak men are when it comes to their own wisdom and their own fallibility because of the fact that they're humans. A knowledge of the Old Testament then is necessary to understanding the New Testament of the Christ. The Old Testament, as some have said, is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. But the Old Testament does not contain in plain, literal language the specific way of salvation through Jesus Christ for man in the Gospel age, in the New Testament period of time. That is where Christ's Word is the way that we live. The perfect law of liberty, James calls it, in James 1.25. These things are to be found in the things that God has spoken to us by His Son. 
And that's in the New Testament of the Christ. The Old Testament contains what God said in a preparatory age and to a people He was using to prepare for the glorious scheme of redemption through His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. You've heard us speak earlier and in earlier lessons we've talked about the three dispensations of time in which God has dealt with man as He unfolded the scheme of redemption and brought Christ into the world and established the church following His ascension to heaven which followed His death. Gave us then the New Testament of His Son via the work of the Holy Spirit through the inspired writers of the New Testament. And they are, of course, the patriarchal age, the father rule period, lasting some 2,500 years. The mosaical period where God, through the law of Moses, directed the children of Israel. And then the one we've been in now for 2,000 years, that is the Christian dispensation, the time of the Lord's church. The church being the elect of God, the family of God, the body of Christ, the kingdom of heaven. And these three great dispensations of time and three great religions in those time periods all were set upon man by the revelation of God for that time period. You know, they've been called, such as the patriarchal age, the starlight age, the mosaical age, the moonlight age, and then the Christian dispensation, the sunlight age. Now think about this for a minute. It's hard around Houston to do this. We don't realize how much artificial life, light handicaps us from seeing the stars on a moonlit night. But the traveler or anyone out in the country, when there's not a thing better as far as light for the night, he's grateful for the very dim light of the stars. You know, that's all you got. It's the best you got. You go, if you want to see how people live longer than they lived under electric lights, then just uh, try to light your house with candles and with kerosene lamps. And you'll see how dim they were, but yet that was the light that went by for a long, long time. And we're happy to have it. And so it is when you have no light at all, the stars, as dim as they may be, are quite full of light for us. But when the full-faced moon emerges upon the horizon, then though it's far dimmer than the sun, it's much more light than the stars. So you don't necessarily then look for the twinkling or shimmering stars, but then when the sun, the full-orbed king of day appears, Interest in the lesser lights is lost. The patriarchal age and those who lived in it definitely appreciated the dim light of that age. There's a reason for that, and I've already said it. It was all they had. So it was with the Israelite under the law of Moses. But now I ask you, why should those of us living in the Christian age, the age of the glorious Son of Righteousness, to make a play on words, see the dim lights of the past when they all pointed to the bright light of day. This those do who turn away from the New Testament and seek for the way of salvation only in the Old Testament. We have a general interest in what God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. But we have a very special interest in what He has spoken to us by His Holy Son, Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the writer penned, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward." How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him? That word spoken by angels refers to what is in the Old Testament. The word spoken by the Lord refers to His last will and testament, our New Testament of the Bible. 
Danger to us lies in neglecting the latter. The same truth is taught later in the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. When the writer put these words down, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishments suppose ye? Shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. Now the New Testament is made up of what Jesus spoke and did, and of what the apostles inspired of the Holy Spirit. Remember last week we studied the ambassadors of the court of heaven, and that's what the apostles were, and what it means to, ambassador of one, to be an ambassador of one government to another. They speak officially. And so the apostles spoke and they did this by authority. Authority from heaven. Proven by the miracle signs and wonders they did to show that they were not speaking of themselves. But it was God by the Holy Spirit through them that spake. And I say again that New Testament contains 27 books. These naturally resolve themselves into four divisions. Matthew... Mark, Luke, and John being the first four. We call that the biographical section because it deals with the life of Christ. And many times you take courses in college and they'll just call it the life of Christ because they'll go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are different, but nevertheless, here's where you find the evidence, incontrovertible evidence, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God. Then there's the next section of the New Testament called the book of Acts, written by the inspired Luke. Acts of apostles. Some of the acts of some of the apostles. But acts. And we find out then, following that as a historical part of the book, teaching us about the church being established and a book full of conversions and non-conversions as they early on went out to preach the word of reconciliation to the world. There are 21 letters, beginning with the epistle of Paul to the Romans and ending then with the little one chapter book of Jude. Now these primarily teach us how to live the Christian life. They're written to individuals and churches. And as a Christian, you'll spend a great deal of time in those books because remember, they're written to Christians. Then there's the book of Revelation. It's the prophetic section of the New Testament written in symbolic language, basically saying that in the end, if you're faithful to God in all things, even if you must give your life to be faithful, you'll receive a crown of life, Revelation 2.10. Now the four books that constitute the first division, I say, are again, keep in mind, books of testimony. If you want to see how the early church went out and proved that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is a son of God, then read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So they are really, to use a legal term, the depositions of the four writers, witnessing to the works of Christ that prove incontrovertibly that he is divine. They tell us about his miraculous birth, They inform us of His wonderful life, the miracles He performed, His gracious teachings, but they also tell us of His very shameful arrest, His mock trial, His illegal condemnation, and His tragic death on the cross of Calvary. Also telling us about His quiet burial, but then His triumphant resurrection, And they conclude with his glorious ascension to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God even now ruling over the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ his power to save us. Romans 1.16 So it was declared by the apostles on the day the church started and in Peter's sermon which is recorded in Acts 2. So they also record then this word of reconciliation that he originally committed to his ambassadors, the apostles of Christ, whom he called 
to set into the world originally the truth of salvation. As I said last week, the early church understood that from the time at the time that it was founded. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. Now in order to salvation, there must be faith. There must be trust and confidence and belief in Jesus Christ as Savior. Now in order to this faith, there must be testimony. It's an amazing thing to me that there's come up over the years this idea that faith has no knowledge connected with it at all. Of course, I understand why. The only kind of knowledge these people realize is empirical knowledge, and that comes through the five senses. They completely reject knowledge that comes by contemplation and reasoning. I find it quite interesting, having been on a jury this past week, that one of the things that they hit on over and over again in the void hour is that we have nobody here in the jury that are eyewitnesses. If so, you would be a witness, not on the jury. You're going to have to make up your mind based upon the evidence and the law governing the case. Now, if you sit in on anything like that, they can be quite, quite educational as to how it really works. And that's no different from how our confidence and trust and belief in Jesus Christ of Nazareth is formed. It comes through evidence, adequate evidence, and credible witnesses. That was another point that was made. You'll have to decide when the witness is on the stand. Having sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Did they? It was quite interesting as I throw this in to see some of the people in the void iron where they're determining who will actually uh, be the jury. They wanted to try the case right there. Sometimes. I'm just in a state, I, I, the old word in English, I sat down a stonied. They don't even know the purpose of the trial. What they're trying to find out is, can you sit there and can you in the light of the law that governs this case and in the testimony, can you determine whether that witness was credible? And in the evidence offered, whether you agree with it or not, can you make up your mind according to it? And to hear some of the things that flowed forth only corroborates one thing. I know why we is in the mess we's in. <laughs> but these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give the testimony upon which we predicate our faith in Christ. And our faith in Christ should not be built upon anything but the evidence God gave to create that confidence and belief. And thus a person seeking to know the truth of salvation must be sure of what he believes in in the case of the Christ being the Savior. And that comes from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth an order, a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things for the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Luke 1, 1 through 4. But we notice this common verse 2, or verses, from John 20, 30 and 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. There's the fundamental reason for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John being the first four books and the last will and testament of Jesus Christ our Savior. I mentioned Acts of Apostles. This constitutes the second division. We call it historical division of the New Testament. It contains establishment of the church in Acts 2. 
It tells us about the early work of the church and really believing that Christ meant the churches to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. It is a book of conversions, and I may say also some non-conversions. It contains the acts, of course not all of them, of the apostles, not all of them. But what does it contain about them? It contains the acts of the apostles in applying the word of reconciliation that Jesus had committed unto them. Two propositions which are incontestably true throw much light on the very purpose of this great book written by Luke, the book of Acts. First of all, in Acts of Apostles, and in that alone, are recorded discourses preached by inspired men to unconverted men and women, the object of which, preaching, was to teach them how to be saved from their sins. The next, number two, in Acts of Apostles and in that alone are recorded cases of conversion under the ministry of Holy Spirit inspired men. Now these propositions refer to the time after Jesus had died for the sins of the world. After, to refer to the law that separated Jews from Gentiles, a middle wall of partition, between the Jew and Gentile had been broken down and after a word of reconciliation was given that embraced the whole world, continues to embrace it, and will do so till the end of time. These propositions being true, one should not begin at the book of Genesis and say, what must I do to be saved by Jesus Christ? We're not talking about not understanding the Bible, not studying Genesis, but we're talking about being saved from sin today. It's good to read through the whole Old Testament for reasons I've already pointed out. But if you knew the whole Old Testament in Hebrew and you could quote all of it, you would not learn how to be saved by Jesus Christ in that study alone. The 21 letters which constitute the third division, the epistolary division, the lengthiest part of the New Testament, as I say earlier, was addressed to Christians, either churches or individual Christians. And they are, and get this, properly books of church order or discipline or what it is to live daily the Christian life, being faithful in the church. Now there's no relation into which it is lawful for a Christian to enter, but what he can here find all needed instruction. I like that. That means that it furnishes me into every good work. It shows me in every facet of life and every detail how to be sure that I have the Lord's mind and how to conduct myself therein. One will end this section learn that he is to deny himself and what it means to deny himself of ungodliness and worldly lust and is to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, Titus 2 and verse 12. That in order to lay hold on everlasting life, he must, 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. And how one does that in every fast of life that he must crucify the flesh with the affections and lust, Galatians 5, 24. That he must add to his faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, which is self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity or love. That the assembling together must not be forsaken because of what we do in that assembly toward God and what it does for us who are engaged all together therein. That he must keep the ordinances, 1 Corinthians eleven twelve, as they have been delivered infallibly in the New Testament. 
as it is not right to take the children's bread, to use the Lord's terminology, and to cast it into the dogs, Mark 7, 27. So the instruction given in this epistolatory division to Christians wasn't meant to be given to the unconverted sinner to teach him how to become a Christian. Certainly could be cited as saying, here's how you're going to live when you're converted. But that's what this section is written for. The one who's become a Christian. The one whose sins have been remitted. The one who's been convicted of sin and by the word of reconciliation converted to Christ. He's a changed person. Beginning on the inside and all over the outside. Thus he studies those things pertaining to how am I sanctified? How am I holy? How do I stay faithful? And those 21 letters are designed to do that. Not to the alien sinner, save to point out here's how you live when you're converted. But for originally those in the church who love the Lord and want to grow up in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and attain heaven. Neither should the instruction given in the second division to alien sinners be turned over to save men and women as if that's all they ever need to study. Is the word of reconciliation and the fundamentals and the plan of salvation. Remember the Hebrews writer said, you leave those things and you go on to perfection. Of course we studied them this morning to set out the reason and how to write and divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 But in individual growth and development, once you're in the church, you need to grow in the church. You need to be sanctified and set apart meat for the master's service. And remember, the plan of salvation can only do what the plan of salvation does. It will not live the Christian life for you. Whether it's belief, repentance, confession of faith in Christ, or baptism. Now they can only do what God meant them to do. And if you do not, from the heart, obey that form of doctrine, you'll never become a Christian. And you'll never be able to grow up in Christ. And you'll never feed on the good word of God concerning growing and developing and being faithful. So each part of the Bible has its place. It's directed to certain people. And it's foolish to approach it and not realize when we see study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's foolish then to, to forget those divisions and why they were given and why God put them in the divine volume. But then there's that last book, the book of Revelation, written by John. Of course, all the book was written by the Bible through human hand. It constitutes the prophetic division, the fourth division. It is a book of prophetic symbols. And it gives in highly figurative style called apocalyptic language the fortunes and destiny of the church of Christ. An account of the great judgment, the separation of the righteous from the wicked, and a description of the eternal home of each class. We want to be in that class that stands before the judgment bar of the Christ and hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Now in order to be able to get there, you're going to have to write and divide the word of reconciliation. For without that word, man cannot be reconciled to God. Sometimes we sing a song, Be ye reconciled. It's my responsibility. God didn't leave me. God's not being reconciled to us. I left God by my sins. I must be reconciled to God. And yet He authored the plan in the great gospel scheme of redemption. And thus there's a word of reconciliation that if we will believe it and obey it, we will be reconciled to God at one with Him again, looking forward to heaven above where someday we'll reside in perfection and in glory. If you're not a Christian, we've studied what one must do to become a Christian in studying the second installment of the Word of Reconciliation, the right division of the Word. If as a child of God you've wondered, you haven't been spending much time in those 21 letters as to how to live the Christian life, or you know them, but you're not living up to them, then the second law of pardon is to repent of your sins, come confessing those sins, and praying God for forgiveness. So what is your circumstance this morning? What's your relationship to, the, to God? Well, it'll all be dependent on your understanding of the Bible. 
It's God's Word. Without your proper knowledge of the Bible, you can't have a saved relationship with God. For you can't be saved without knowing properly the word of reconciliation. If you're subject to the Lord's blessed call this morning, we invite you to respond to Him and comply with the word of reconciliation. While together we stand and sing.